Can everyone see my, oh, just do the uh, slideshow, sorry. So can everyone see that or is, is a, I'm hoping everyone sees that. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for and thank the organizers for inviting me today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I would have loved to be there and see a lot of old friends. Bagua, my best regards to you and from Michael as well. It's been many years. So lovely to be here. So today um, I'd like to talk about the vanadium battery, but more about the electrolyte development. Um, and mainly the work that we've done at the university over the years in terms of its performance, in performance improvements and cost reduction. So with the, um, at the university, we started in, uh, our work on the vanadium battery in 1984 and between 1984 and 2000, we've done an extensive amount of work in all different areas. So all uh, that very early work led to the filing of very first flow battery patent in 1986 with an early license to Mitsubishi Chemicals and Kashima Kita Electric Power Corporation in the early 1990s. So during the period 1984 to 2000, we, we, we conducted basic chemical, electrochemical studies, screening, characterization, selection of membranes, electrodes, cell materials. Very importantly, the work, uh, we focused a lot of our efforts on the development of, of the vanadium battery electrolyte processes. Uh, we did early stack design and development, built and tested several one to five kilowatt stacks, developed various state of charge sensors. We did very, our first field trials in a solar house and golf cart. And we studied, did a lot of um, extensive studies on electrolyte additives in order to stabilize higher than two mole of vanadium electrolytes and extend the, the temperature range as well. Um, and also in what we've been doing and continuing in recent years as well is a lot of electrochemical and thermal modeling and control as well. So these are the areas that we've, we're currently focusing, but we started back then in the uh, before 2000 as well. So as I mentioned, around 1993-94, the university issued its first license to Mitsubishi Chemicals and Kashima Kita Power Corporation. And within a few years of the license, they had already been working on iron chromium batteries uh, at the, uh, within their company. But they, when they, after they did the license with us, they converted over to vanadium. And within a few years, they built the first large scale 200 kilowatt, 800 kilowatt hour vanadium battery at the Kashima Kita power station and demonstrated an energy efficiency of 80%, which was quite, quite remarkable for the, the first scaling up. Uh, in 2001, the university license and all the Mitsubishi Kashima Kita technology was acquired by Sumitomo. And as we all know, Sumitomo has been doing extensive work in commercialization and field testing and demonstration and, and, uh, and engineering of the large scale vanadium flow batteries since then. Uh, around the same time, we also, the university also issued a license to a, a Thai company. And together we built, we, inst we installed at the very first vanadium flow battery in a solar demonstration house in Thailand. Um, and, but unfortunately, the, the, the company, uh, which it, it wasn't a battery company, it was actually a, a, a construction company, and they ceased to operate after a few years. Uh, in, in the slightly later, in 1996 to 97, we started working on uh, the application of vanadium batteries in mobile applications, because everyone was interested in the possibility of exchanging electrolyte for refueling. So it was suggested that we might do a demonstration. So we acquired um, a, an electric golf cart and we built a couple of different prototypes to, to push, uh, uh, to install on the electric um, golf cart with the tanks underneath. And we had during the during the period that we had it on campus, we had a lot of visitors, including one of our ministers who's seen here uh, riding on the uh, golf cart back in 1997. So as I mentioned before, one of the first things that we wanted we focused on was the uh, vanadium electrolyte process uh, production because we initially started producing vanadium electrolyte from vanadol sulfate, but very quickly we realized vanadol sulfate was way too expensive and was, was not economically viable for commercial applications. So we were told that we should, but one of our early uh, licensees, which was um, 
uh, Agnew Clough Limited, which had a vanadium mine in Western Australia back then. They acquired an early license as well. And they suggest that we, that we needed to, to use vanadium pentoxide as our raw material. But vanadium pentoxide, as we all know, doesn't dissolve. So we, we started an extensive program to see how we can produce, develop processes to produce the electrolyte from vanadium pentoxide. And one of our researchers at the time, Rod McDermott, um, did, thought he'd do a, a rough experiment. He took a, a beaker of sulfuric acid, put in some vanadium pentoxide powder, swirled it around with a magnetic stirrer, put two electrodes in, in the beaker, passed the current through that. And after a very short period of time, he came running and said, Maria, it's dissolving. So very quickly we realized that we could do, use suspended powder electrolysis to dissolve the uh, vanadium pentoxide powder. Initially, he didn't have a membrane in between. So the vanadium pentoxide powder would be reduced at the negative electrode to form V3 or V2, and then that would diffuse to the positive electrode where it would be reoxidized. So all we could produce without in this membraneless cell was just V4. So we quickly put in uh, an, a membrane in between, and then we just had the vanadium pentoxide powder on the negative side and generating oxygen and sulfuric acid on the positive side. We then realized that we could also use chemical reduction. So we developed processes that used sulfur dioxide and, and organ, uh, ox oxalic acid and other chemical reductants as well. So during the, our studies, when we were studying the suspended powder electrolysis, we realized when we were trying to understand the mechanism of what was happening, we realized that what was actually happening, we were producing during the electrolysis, we were producing V3 ions in solution. And it was the V3 ions that were, dis, that, that were reacting with the V2F5 powder to cause it to dissolve. So we thought, well, okay, how do we turn this into a, a continuous leaching process where we can actually electrochemically generate the V3 ions and use those to dissolve as chemical as the chemical reductant to dissolve the V2O5. So we actually built a pilot plant in the late mid-1990s to produce 100 litres a day of V3.5 solution where we had a mixing tank where we added the sulfuric acid V2O5 powder and electrochemically generated V3 ions in an electrolysis cell to produce and then fed that into the reactor, the mixing tank, to produce the V3.5 solution, which would then become the product of the process. But part of that was recycled back into the electrolysis cell where we would produce, we'd produce more V3, V3 plus ions. And that process, as I said, we, we turned it into a pilot scale and we were able to, to, to produce the significant quantities that we used that solution to send to, to Thailand for our solar cell. But, but we also realized that it was the, we could, rather than generating V3 ions, we could just take the V2, V2O3 powder, partially, partially dissolve it, and then add V2O5 powder and allow that process to, to occur as a reactive dissolution process in a, in a mixing tank. So we start, we filed a patent on that. And we, well, we found that um, there were a few issues with using V2O3 powder. First of all, V2O3 back then was about three times the cost of V2O5. So it was going to be much more expensive. And given the stoichiometry that we'd need to produce V3.5, we needed a lot more V2O3. So, so, and the other thing, of course, is the V2O3 is reacts with oxygen. So it doesn't store very well. So it was always very careful, always had to be very careful that we stored the V2O3 out of oxygen, otherwise it would slowly react to V2O4. And when we mix the two together to produce v V3.5, we would in fact produce V3.8, sometimes V4 instead. So, but we also found that this was a simple process. So, and we found that that in order to make the process uh, operate efficiently and, and, and get good fast dissolution, we found, we studied a few different types of powders and we realized that if we could um, have a certain uh, pa uh, uh, particle size distribution and pore size distribution, then we'd be able to get the fastest dissolution uh, kinetics. So we found a pattern on, on that process as well back then in 2002. Now the electrolyte, as we so it's not just a matter of producing the electrolyte. So if we can, if we've got a good raw material, V two O three, V two O four, high purity raw material, we can produce the electrolyte using a number of different methods. 
But the, the final purity of the electrolyte is critical uh, as far as we are aware at the moment. We don't really have a, a, a detailed understanding of what each of the, the possible impurities is likely to have, what, what effect is likely to have on, on the performance of the vanadium battery and its cycle life. And so because of that, there's no universal electrolyte standard and each company, as we heard from Terry today, uses their own specification and that creates major issues for the electrolyte producers. So we, but we know that certain we can predict that certain impurities will have uh, some some impurities will increase hydrogen evolution during charging. Others can either reduce or increase the vanadium reaction kinetics or cause precipitation. But impurities can originate from a number of sources: from the vanadium oxide powders, from the sulfuric acid supporting electrolyte from the water used in the electrolyte production. So all of these, we currently focus a lot on producing very high quality, very high purity vanadium oxide powder, but we don't look carefully enough at the purity of the sulfuric acid that is used to produce the electrolyte or even the water that's used. So I think this is something that all vanadium, vanadium electrolyte producers have to focus on and make sure that you can source high quality, high purity sulfuric acid as well. Otherwise we're wasting our, our time purifying the vanadium oxide powders. But even if we start with a very pure, pure vanadium electrolyte, during operation, there is a possibility that you can get impurities leaching from the cell or battery components if you don't choose the right type of components to produce or the, the, the battery itself. But also if there's any leak of the electrolyte onto the copper current collector, uh, if the cell stack hasn't been properly fabricated and assembled, you can get copper contamination uh, the, pop, the, so the acid will leach the copper, it will diffuse to the negative electrode, played out on the negative electrode, uh, uh, increase and, and uh, enhance hydrogen evolution, which causes major problems. So in order to predict the effect of different uh, ions on hydrogen evolution, we can just look up the tables on, of, on, of hydrogen over voltage on different types of metals. And this is a table which gives the equilibrium exchange current densities. So the, the higher the number, the better, the lower the activation of, um, sorry, the, the lower the equilibrium exchange current density because it's 10 to the minus. Um, so with, as we would expect, you know, uh, noble metals, things like copper, cobalt, these things potentially could be catalysts for hydrogen evolution. So we need to be careful of those. Um, so, that, so some metals we know will catalyze hydrogen evolution and of the, of the above, above metals, we can see that but that depends also on where their standard reduction potential is relative to the V2, V3 couple. So copper, nickel, tin and silver have standard reduction potentials, which are less negative than the V2, V3 couple, which means that during charging, they will deposit on the negative electrode. Other metals, such as cobalt, indium, cadmium, chromium, and so on, have a more negative standard reduction potential than the 2 v 3 So they'll only deposit at the negative electrode during charging if the potential becomes sufficiently negative at, at very high states of charge or during overcharge. So these are some predictions that we can make. But it's also good to be able to know how much, what are the limits that we can, can tolerate uh, for different types of uh, impurities. So many years ago, we started with some accelerated testing where we took some pure uh, VOSO4, made the electrolyte, starting off with uh, pure sulfuric acid and using, adding different quantities of different impurities and then doing some cyclic voltammetry where we cycled it for about 24 hours and then try to observe any changes in the cyclic voltammetry, uh, both with and without the impurity. So this was just an initial attempt to, to screen some of the metals. And we could see, as we would expect, certain uh, ions had no effect on hydrogen. In some cases, we, we actually saw improvements in the vanadium couple reversibility. Uh, other other uh, impurities, other elements or ions increased hydrogen, the hydrogen um, evolution rate, uh, but had no effect on the reversibility. Others had a detrimental effect on some of the uh, uh, redox couple re reactions. So, but the problem is, you know, we can do all these studies, but what we don't see really is the effect of, where we have different interactions where so there's, it's a, such a complicated thing to do an, ex, an exhaustive 
and uh, comprehensive study. Uh, so that's where I think that's why things people have been hesitant to say to to accept lower purity vanadium electrolytes because they really don't know. So to be on the safe side, everyone just said, uh, specifies very high purity, and that way they they're not going to they're not going to uh, encounter pro unexpected problems. But unfortunately, that is could potentially be creating a greater cost for the elect, uh, electrolyte production. So we really need to know what are the limits that we can tolerate and can we use lower purity vanadium. But as I, as I also showed before, some impurities that, or some elements that you, when you add them to the electrolyte can actually catalyze the reaction as well. We were doing, uh, in recent years, we did some electrocatalysis studies where we used um, molybdenum oxide as an electrocatalyst on the electrode surface to, and we've observed dramatic increases in power density and, and, um, and reversibility. But then we, we thought, well, how about if we just add the molybdenum into the electrolyte? Because during cycling, you expect the molybdenum to play, to deposit somehow as either, yeah, and in fact, it can deposit as an oxide on the positive side as well. So, we found that just by adding the molybdenum to the electrolyte, and we and we had studied that many years ago, we looked at other additives as well, and we did file a patent many years ago, which we abandoned as well, where we did observe that adding certain elements to the electrolyte uh, inc improved the reversibility and enhanced the performance. So this is an area again where the where the the, the um, properties of the electrolyte are so important in determining the performance of the battery as well. This is just some more results on, on the comparison, comparing the uh, electric catalytic effect of the oxide powder as well versus the, ox the oxide in the solution. So other things that we need to look at uh, to consider with the electrolyte is the energy density because the the higher the concentration of the vanadium is in the acid, the higher the energy density, the lower the volume of the electrolyte that we can that uh, we need for a certain number of kilowatt hours in terms of the volume. Um, but there are limits to how much we can increase the solubility because we know that V2, V3, V4, they all their solubility decreases at low temperatures. V5 solubility it decreases at high temperatures. So that's why we have this. Of operating temperature. So in the early days, we always used to use a two mole of vanadium solution in five molar sulfuric acid. And as long as we operate continuously when we don't, it doesn't stand for very long at very high temperatures or very low temperatures, then it, it operates quite well between 15 to 40 degrees centigrade because you're constantly converting the vanadium ions from one oxidation state to the other, it doesn't have time to, to precipitate. But if you if you if the solution stays in a high, highly high SSC or low SSC for long periods of time, then there is a risk if the temperature gets too high or too low that you could get precipitation. So most people have dropped the concentration below two molar to either 1.6 to 1.8, and that allows them to uh, it gives them better better um, uh, security in terms of you know, in, in, in ensuring that they don't get precipitation. And we're all probably aware that Pacific Northwest Laboratories uh, developed a mixed acid electrolyte where they mix sulfuric acid and with, with HCR. And by doing that, they're actually able to increase the hydrogen ion concentration without increasing, uh, without uh, decreasing the solubility due, uh, due to the common ion effect of either sulfate or chloride ions. So that's why, um, you know, concentrations of higher than two molar, up to 2.7 molar can be achieved with the mixed acid. But we also found that with, we can achieve concentrations above three mole of vanadium by adding using stabilizing agents. And in fact, uh, we did produce a, a, a three molar vanadium solution um, you, where we and we published and we filed a few patents after testing a wide range of uh, of additives. So again. Adding things to the electrolyte can have another, another really important effect, and that is to stabilize the electrolyte against precipitation. So we were able to, we actually found that some inhibitors, precipitation inhibitors, can stabilize up to four mole of vanadium electrolyte concentrations. 
So during that, in the mid 1990s, we screened, we screened hundreds of organic and inorganic additives, and, and we screened them in, both, in all the different oxidation states, because a lot of people have been recently sort of extending some of this work and only reporting how a certain additive will, have, will improve the stability of E5, for example, but they don't show what effect it has at the low temperatures for everything else. So if you're going to be um, investigating a stabilizing agent, it has to, they have to be able to stabilize all oxidation states at the high temperatures and the low temperatures. And we found there's a wide range of additives that, that uh, have that effect. They have to have certain uh, um, functional groups uh, on, on, in, on, in their structure. And we believe that those functional groups absorb onto the surface of the, of the nuclei and inhibit the crystal growth. And amongst all the our initial screening, we, we found we selected phosphoric acid initially, and phosphoric acid was then actually incorporated by Sumitomo and Mitsubishi Chemicals into their standard electrolyte composition. And that's why pretty much most people these days have used the composition which is sulfuric acid with some phosphoric acid that came from our initial work. Um, under, under, and so that it was then transferred, the license was transferred to, uh, to Kashima Kita and Mitsubishi Chemicals. But we also found other things, apart from you know, certain types of phosphates and ammonium compounds are also extremely effective. And these are just some of the results where we looked at the induction time and degree of precipitation of uh, two molar, V2, for example, at five degrees. And again, we see phosphoric acid, we see uh, ammonium phosphate as being very effective. Uh, this is for V2. Uh, we also see for V3 at, five, at one degree centigrade in this experiment. Um, we also, we also ex studied some of these additives in two molar V5 in, uh, at 50 degrees centigrade. And again, we could see a, a dramatic effect in the, um, in the degree of reduction in the degree of precipitation at 100%, 90%, 80% state of charge with certain additives. And the way they act is that they don't increase the solubility of the iron, they, they enhance, they increase the induction time for precipitation. And this shows the effect of different additives on the induction time. Uh, we then went on and prepared a three mole of vanadium solution uh, and put it into our electric golf cart that we had at the time. And we were able to, to operate it for extended periods of, for an extended period of time at around room temperature and driving it around the university with a three molar electrolyte. That three molar electrolyte, once we finished that and, and, and mothballed our electric golf cart, we actually put it into some drums and it was sitting for, for 22 years uh, in one of our laboratories at the university. And in, in, two, that, in 2020, we, we retested it and we found it was still as, uh, had, there was no sign of precipitation. So after 22 years, three molar solution was still uh, effective there. So I think I'm running out of time, but I think we need to also look at how we, how we can achieve cost reduction. Apart from increasing power density, we need to reduce component costs. But another way is to reduce the actual vanadium requirement or the electrolyte purity. And that's some, something that we probably haven't done enough of, seeing how lower purity vanadium electrolytes could, could work in the battery. But we could re reduce the vanadium, the amount of vanadium by moving away from an all vanadium redox flow battery and having a vanadium oxygen redox fuel cell where the positive half cell electrolyte is replaced by an oxygen gas diffusion electrode. That way you only have half the amount of vanadium that you need for, for every kilowatt hour that you produce. So we've, that this was initially proposed by Kaneko and co-workers in 1992. We started evaluating in 97. Uh, for other workers have done some research uh, to extend that further. And uh, a couple of years ago, using some funding from the US Office of Naval Research, we, we produced, a, a th we actually used a 3.6 mole of vanadium electrolyte with additives and, at, at operating at high temperature to, op to run the uh, vanadium oxygen redox fuel cells. And so these are some of the early experiments that we did with the 3.6 molar vanadium electrolyte. And this very quickly just uh, compares energy density, but I won't go into that. So in summary, uh, we're seeing a huge amount of attention on flow batteries these days. 
Uh, several companies are producing commercial vanadium battery systems. We're now seeing new membranes and electrode materials helping to reduce the cost, improve soil architectures, uh, are also increasing uh, energy, uh, power density, which is also adding to uh, cost reduction. Improvements in the electrolyte chemistry are, are also enhancing energy density and operating temperature range. And with the vanadium oxygen, even though it's still early days, the vanadium oxygen fuel cell promises to have up to 100 um, what else per kilogram of energy density with half the vanadium requirement. But there's still a lot of R&D needed before commercialization. But the important thing that we, I think we all need to look at is that there is at the moment, there's no global vanadium electrolyte specification that, that can be used by all electrolyte producers. Unfortunately, most developers and manufacturers are refusing to share their data, so we can't be able to, we're, we're unable to, to achieve this global electrolyte specification, which will help all, the whole industry. Um, but if we can also you go to uh, do further research to see how we can use lower purity vanadium, then again, uh, further cost reduction could be achieved. So thank you for your attention. Any questions? Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Maria. Thank you for wonderful sharing. Any questions? Hello? Dr. Maria, are you online? Yes. Yes, yes, I'm still here. Can you see me? Uh, okay. We can't see you. Okay, it's a great honor to talk with you. You know, I feel amazing because it's like you are in a live bubble industry, but you are talking to Thomas Edison. So, yeah, I feel great. And you are a graceful and beautiful lady. So, <laughs> I get your information about the electrolyte improvement. And uh, in a summary, you talked about the new memory and the electrode material to help the cost down of the system. Uh, can you enlighten us about the electrode material uh, choosing uh, instead of the carbon felt we are using now because it caused a lot of uh, flow resistance and uh, cause uh, we use a very big, huge stack. So do you have any idea to share us with that? Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of the work now that's going on in the zero gap reactors is extremely important uh, in reducing the cell resistance. Uh, and that work was initially done in pure cells. So by having the zero gap reactor um, where the two electrodes come up against the membrane with very thin carbon paper. But when you go to a very thin carbon paper, the surface area is dramatically reduced. So, so normally carbon felt has a very high surface area. So your actual effective current density is extremely low. That's why you have very low over voltage and you can achieve quite good kinetics because of the very high surface area. But when you move to, or to carbon paper, the surface area is dramatically reduced. And then you have to definitely have electrocatalysts. Without the electrocatalysts, then you don't, can't achieve very high power, current densities or power densities. Um, using the zero gap reactor, but but the zero gap reactor dramatically reduces the internal resistance, which is and and with with carbon felt, it's mainly uh, ohmic resistance that we're, that creates most of the the energy efficiency losses because the over voltage is very low because of the very low op effective current densities. So again, uh, in recent years we've been seeing quite a lot of manufacturers of carbon felts, and and a lot of them are actually producing activated carbon fill so you don't have to take it into the laboratory or into the factory and thermally treat it because it's already been done uh, at the factory. Um, many different producers are, and developers are making membranes. We did a lot of that many years ago, but we, we ourselves are not doing membrane development or modification at the moment. We're focusing more on the battery management systems, on the um, on the operation and, and modeling and uh, and uh, 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 sensors and optimal operation and control systems at the moment. That's our, ma our main focus, but also on the vanadium electrolyte so we can, we can optimize the process for making cheap vanadium electrolyte. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Any other question? Hi, 
My, uh, um, as far as I concerned, might come down to zero point like six uh, RMB in the future three years. Um, so, okay, so which use uh, uh, scenario or electricity market will pay for VRB or such kind of uh, uh, flow battery? Because uh, we all know the VRB has longer lifetime but bears very high uh, high cost, well, at least higher than lithium battery. No, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, a couple of things. I think lithium batteries at the moment, or up to up to now, have received a lot of funding uh, because different companies, different countries, wanted to have very high production capacity for electric cars. Up to now, the demand, well, up to recently, the demand from electric cars wasn't as high. But because of the high production capacity they were able to put in place, they were, they were able to reduce the cost. What we, we haven't seen yet the same level of uh, manufacturing scale and capacity with flow batteries and all the components that, that go into flow batteries. Hopefully, as the scale production volume increases, all those components will come down. With regard to the, the vanadium electrolyte, as we increase the production capacity of vanadium oxide, we have new mines coming online, and as Vince, Vincent, hi Vincent, um, has told us already, then we'll see the vanadium prices stabilizing and dropping. But even so, even beyond that, this leasing model, which I think is very exciting because that means that the, the buyer, the owner of the vanadium battery doesn't have to buy the electrolyte. So the cost drops dramatically, and then it becomes much cheaper than, than lithium. And especially when you factor in the much longer life, the levelized cost is even cheaper again. So I really think, especially for uh, long duration, hours of storage, vanadium will always be. Um,